Costco from Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, for the last generation, I you have a choice. Com, the Republican candidate I did for not governor. have sexual relations with I that realize woman. that this is something he is We're not going to be able to solve our problems if we get distracted by sideshows and carnival barbers. One Republican, one Democrat, and you discuss the issues that matter in today's local, state, national, and global politics. Hosted by Steve Hickson with co-hosts John Stanberry and Franklin Chansey. This is Backfire. Hey, Cleveland. Welcome to Whoop Radio right here at the Village Green Town Center in Cleveland, Tennessee. Got another exciting show here for you this morning with John Stanberry and Franklin Chansey and uh, all these different things going on around the world. It just makes it hard to settle in on what we really want to talk about. But let's, uh, let's welcome in our new airport here in town. The jet port opens. All right. Hooray. Hey, now we have two airports going. That's what the mayor said the other day during his Main Street meeting. He said, we now have two airports. For a while. For a while. It sounds like uh, the plan is that uh, they're going to keep that uh, the, the old airport open until the new guys get moved from the airport with their new hangars to the new location. And then it should be closing down, I'd say, sometime this summer. But now the hangars aren't built at the new one yet, right? That's right. Yeah, they've got to build the hangars and some of this stuff. So, anyway, it's probably going to be a while. I'd say probably at least a year. But, uh, anyway, then they'll be selling off the old property out there. And uh, uh, that'll be the end of the old Hardwick Field, as we know it. Anyway, the jet port, I was there for the grand opening. It was an exciting event. Have you been out to the new hangar, either one of you? I have driven by it, but I haven't stopped to see it yet. I highly recommend you stop. I, not. I tell you, you guys ought to stop and I heard go it's in. It's pretty impressive. It's it's very impressive. You need to go out there and, and walk through it and and uh, see what uh, Cleveland's got there now. You know, it's designed for um, for business people to be able to fly in and hold a meeting there. In other words, uh, let's say M and M Mars, uh, they needed to have a meeting with their employees. They have, to have their employees actually come to the airport. Uh, they've got a catering room. They have a meeting rooms there. They could actually have the meeting at the airport with the employees, and then the, the uh, guys would get back on the plane, head back out, and uh, never even have to go to the plant facility. Cool. Whirlpool the same way, and you know other manufacturers. Also, any new business thinking about coming to Cleveland could fly in, meet with our representatives at the airport. They could have a meeting, talk about Cleveland at the new jet port, and. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Well, you know, one of the one of the art. Not everybody was obviously uh, thrilled with the airport, and and one of the things, uh, Lisa and I found ourselves in an interesting position because we had opposed the uh, original idea of an airport because they were condemning land, and uh, we had always said that if you have willing buyers and willing sellers, then I don't think government ought to get in the way, and that's how this ended up. But Lisa did say that when a company looks at coming to the community. Uh, they actually have a checklist, and this may not seem fair to people, but one of the things on the checklist is the airport. And, of course, the comment was always, well, we can get past that with other things. The problem is you don't get past it. They look at that checklist, and if you don't have an airport, they don't even come look at your community. That's right. That's right. So, you know, I, I, can, uh, I can tell you there is a lot of business. A lot of people don't realize it, but there is a lot of business flying around in our friendly skies now. And hopefully uh, – our new airport will be a magnet that will attract some of the, that, that new industry and some of these things that might help prosper Cleveland. Uh, I'm looking at the Chattanooga Times this morning. It's pretty interesting about the uh, Chattanooga Police Department. It's going to move. Uh, they had all these new officers uh, that they're training on the front page and said that the city wants 500 police officers by 2015. Then it went on to talk about... Uh, uh, Memphis, Knoxville, Nashville, and Chattanooga. Basically, it looks like they're talking about 200. <clears throat> uh, well, let's, Nashville has 219 per 100,000 population officers, 0. 0.3. Chattanooga has 263.4 officers per 100,000 population. Knoxville has 211.7 officers per 100,000 population. And Memphis has 310.4 per 100,000 population. The average salary runs uh, in Chattanooga is 111,178. That's, that's the estimated cost for the uh, salary, for training, equipment, everything. Let me, let me finish. Salary plus cost? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, 111,178 in Chattanooga, uh, Nashville, 117, 135, Knoxville, roughly 100,000, 99,491, and Memphis, 99,214,000. Anyway, there's been a survey done, and I thought that was pretty interesting. I'd like to try to do a comparison of what our police force runs on the survey based on what other cities are doing, officers per capita and so forth. Well, Steve, I haven't had time to read that, but just listening to you read that off, I think you said 267 per 100,000 in in Chattanooga. There's around 300,000 people in in Chattanooga, so you're talking about close to 800 officers. If they're going to add, what did it say, 500 more? No, no, they want to have 500. They want to have 500. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I understand. I was about to say that's a huge increase in the number of police. (laughs) Yeah. Those are authorized to have 470 right now, and they want to increase it to 500. Well, I can say Chattanooga probably needs it. I don't know if they can hire enough down there to get that city completely safe right now. Well, the problem with completely safe, though, is the crime statistics all across the country, including Chattanooga, have actually been decreasing over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, You know, I guess things like this, I always want to know, all right, do we need that many new policemen? Is there a, is there a problem? Is that the best place to spend our tax dollars? Mm-hmm. Well, this article, I, you know, I read it pretty quickly this morning, but it was talking about you won't see a real you – won't, you won't be able to rationalize the cost effectiveness, but just having the troops on the ground keeps the crime from happening. In other words, it detours the crime that you don't know about, you don't see. In other words, crime, um, uh, you know, you may have some of these gangs and so forth. If it's well policed, they may not decide to do business in town there. They may head out. Yeah, yeah, but the problem with that is how do you quantify that is, is, you know, if we're talking about adding, let's say we're adding 100 officers, what kind of impact is that going to make in the crime? And would 120 officers be, you know, that much better? Or would 500 new officers make us completely safe? Mm-hmm. You, the public really ought to have some quantification of this. And, and one of the ways government grows is we do these kind of murky uh, expansions. We don't really uh, prove anything. Thing. We don't really document anything, mm-hmm. but people, you know, once you get those officers in place, what public person is going to say, mm-hmm. yeah, let's get rid of some of these officers because government's too big. Once you get it, it's very difficult to get rid of it. And I'm not, I'm all for the police. Don't get me wrong. I just want to make sure that we actually have fact-based discussions on expanding government. Mm-hmm. What I- the, the statistics they were relying on shows that adding police officers tends to have a larger impact on lowering violent crime than it does over property crimes. Property crimes don't seem to be affected a lot by that, according to this article. Um, and that's. But violent crime has actually been on the decrease. Yes, but many cities have added lots of police officers over the last several years. Plus, a lot of people bought guns too. Well, there's there's <laughs> possibly there's actually concern. There was a story just a few days ago about a program that was started in the 90s and. Uh, we locally have taken advantage of this. Uh, Sheriff Gobble several years ago uh, bought a armored, uh, I don't know if it was a tank or assault weapon, yeah. assault vehicle from the, the government when they retire these. A lot of the departments are doing that. Well, a lot of citizens are looking at that and going, you know, do we really want a police force that has Tanks. armored vehicles and, you know, 50 caliber machine guns? What's the real point of that? Now, if you're in urban Detroit and you're battling heavily armed uh, gangs, that may be one thing. But did Cleveland, Tennessee really need an armored vehicle to push <laughs> holes in people's houses? <laughs> it's uh, I've seen that one time. It was kind of comical looking at when they was moving it around. <laughs> well, we, we put requests in for helicopters. <laughs> And there's submarines. You can, you know, somebody joked, well, we've got the Okoy and the Hawassi. I guess we ought to have a submarine out there. <laughs> I was looking at the physical requirements. Uh, let's see if you guys would pass the physical requirements. Not likely. <laughs> uh, one and a half mile run completed within 14 minutes and 36 seconds. I don't know. Okay. 25 push-ups in, in one minute. I think I could Maybe. do that one. 25 sit-ups in I a minute. I could do that. Yeah. Cadets must be able to bench press 82% of their body weight. I could do that. Okay. Complete a vertical jump of, of 18 and a half inches. Well, with my back, the jump might not be a problem. The landing might be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Run the 300 meter in 60 seconds. 
I don't know. Do you get CPR at the end? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, uh, there's some other stuff in there about cities with most crimes and some of this stuff, but I won't get into that. Another interesting uh, story I saw in the Times this morning was the University of Tennessee eyes fracking on state property. Have y'all heard anything about that? I just and saw not that the article. UT one, but there was a story just a day or two ago as well on this whole corridor. And if you saw the map, it really stretches up through Hamilton, basically up the valley here, all the way up through uh, several counties uh, north of Hamilton. Um, my question on that is, as I read that story, they drill about a mile down. Most of the water, the, the groundwater is at 800 to 1,000 feet. So they're drilling 5,400 feet down. Then they turn and they, they the story said they drill for miles uh, horizontally. Well, my right. question might be to Franklin, from a legal standpoint of property owners with their mineral rights, how do you drill for miles horizontally? Do you have to buy the mineral rights for anybody's land you drill under? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this. There are all kinds of deeds up in the Copper Basin area I've seen uh, where people own property, but their mineral, mineral rights are excluded right. from those deeds. So that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, they were talking about at the University of Tennessee, I think it was 8,800 acres that they've got up in the Cumberland Mountains somewhere. Well, but, but the story the other day indicated that northern – Hamilton County and I guess uh, Southern Bradley were actually the main place they wanted to drill in East Tennessee. Right. That that's where the bulk of the uh, apparently the shale deposit is. In East Tennessee as well, there's different things they inject out into the the land to break open the cracks. Uh, apparently, in our area, based on the soil type, the majority of it is sand and nitrogen. Some of the other areas inject some other chemicals that I think are more. Uh, troubling, but nitrogen would be the main chemical they inject here, which theoretically we breathe about right. eight seventy percent nitrogen anyway. All that is black gold, Texas tea. Well, they're going for natural gas. <laughs> okay, it's natural. all for natural well, gas. Well, we'll, we'll call it. Uh, 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 it's not black gold. What would that be called then? I guess that'd be the clear odorless gold. Or, odorless gold. <laughs> clear odorless gold, right here in Tennessee, right under our feet. Just think about it. We could, uh, we could be sitting on a wealth of property. Well, we have massive amounts of natural gas deposits in North America. I, you know, I think this is all very interesting. Uh, I'm still a little bit on the on the fence, so to speak, because I read lots of different stories about potential problems caused by the fracking process that do deal with groundwater and things of that nature. And I, and I hope that the technology is such that we don't have to deal with well, it's that. It's been around since know. about 1947. So, it, you know, that's another problem. The perception out there is, oh, this is a brand new technology. It's actually been around decades. The idea has been around, but the technology to, to, implement. to implement it down deep like that is relatively new. And so that's why we've had this explosion over the last, oh, what? 10 years in particular. Well, the, the disturbing thing is we can loan hundreds of millions of dollars to solar companies that go bankrupt, but we're not pressing for really a, a resource that you can run your cars on this. You know, we've already got uh, municipal buses in some cities that are running on this. Natural gas could actually save us multiple levels. Economically, it could save us on the terrorism front. We wouldn't be dependent on countries that hate us right now. I think well, our number one goal ought to be getting independent from these uh, foreign terrorist companies uh, countries I mean whatever it takes for us to get independent from these guys from having to buy oil from them having to buy any kind of chemicals from what they we need to put ourselves in a position they need us we don't need them what do well, you think Frank well that was certainly the idea um, that was being touted by a lot of folks over the last four or five years on both sides of the aisle uh, that is, uh, you remember T. Boone, T. Boone Pickens, I think, two years ago had this big plan to promote natural gas. Yeah. Uh, I know that there is a company uh, that is uh, massively growing right now uh, that is uh, converting uh, diesel vehicles to natural gas because it turns out they run on about 85% of the same parts, so the conversion's not exorbitantly expensive to start uh pursuing new ones uh, that could have a uh, I think I saw that the average diesel 18 wheeler gets about eight miles to the gallon so uh, if you stopped consuming that much diesel 
you'd also be putting dramatically less particulate and so forth out Much into the cleaner. atmosphere at that point. Uh, so there's probably something to be said for that. Although that's the same, your idea is the same reason. Uh, I, I know you, you laugh about it, but that's the same idea trying to seed these other technologies out there. It's to help us get off of dependence on oil. But Franklin, the problem with these other technologies is, to be perfectly honest, at their best in the next mm -hmm. 40 years, they'll never be able to run our economy. Natural gas could actually run our economy. Well, that's not necessarily true. They're also putting uh, resources into uh, wind, hydrogen, all sorts of things that have the com the ability, because we're not just talking about getting off oil, we're also talking about uh, uh, other types of, of things like coal, for example, putting less of that out into the atmosphere. Well, the Obama know. administration has successfully destroyed the coal industry. And the problem is about 80% of all our energy that we run our households with is, is done it's, by coal-fired plants. Except what you're seeing is that you're getting a tremendous amount of growth and development in utilities converting over to natural gas but processes, Franklin, Franklin, which the, is a good thing for us. The natural gas is, but the Obama administration isn't pushing that. It's pushing all these uh, programs in areas that normal capitalist money doesn't flow into because there's no return. Actually, what they've done is provide some tax incentives for utilities to Actually, make Actually, they gave away money to their bundlers who own these companies. How's General Motors doing these days? General Motors itself is doing pretty good. Their stock is worth a, a, probably a third of what it would have to be worth for the <laughs> taxpayer to get their money back. The taxpayer has gotten its money no, back he, on No, they have not. They did that to us. We've gone through this before. Mm -hmm. They shuffled around tax credits and allowed them to claim they paid back, but it was actually taxpayer money that they paid it back with. There is no question that virtually all of the money into the so-called bailouts has been recouped by the government. That's absolutely false. Absolutely false. General Motors cannot make money the way they operate. Well, first of all, they they've changed survive. the way they've operated, number oh, one. What, what did, did they, they change the labor contracts? Yes. Yeah, significantly? Have. Yeah. What did they do? Well, they changed the pension funding tremendously. Oh, that, that means that if you were a bondholder they reduced, they reduced, they reduced the They reduced the... Uh, the workforce dramatically. And they, they did that, Franklin, cutbacks. they did and that by robbing here's the bondholders the of their the obligated money. You guys all skip over. There's a big difference. There's a good article this morning in the paper, as a matter of fact, comparing some aspects of Ford and GM. Ford's touted as this big success for it. Well, here's what's interesting. Ford is making a huge profit in the United States right now, but they're losing money in the rest of the world. GM is barely breaking even right now in the United States in its operations, but they're making really large profits in their international activity. That's because they took a lot of the taxpayer dollars Obama gave them and they spent them on plants in China. That's not accurate. Congratulations, taxpayer. That's you helped true, build the economy in China. That's completely false. It is not false, It is, not false, it is false. Do you think they're not making any money because people don't want to support them in America? No, I think people are going to buy the best cars they can find for their money. I think the problem for GM in a lot of ways over the last 15 years in particular had been that the quality of the product was not good. The product good. declined because there was no incentive to the worker to produce a better car mm -hmm. because the unions had strangled the company. And what Obama did is bail the unions out at the bondholders' expense. That's funny. The management of GM doesn't seem to think Of course that, not though. because he bailed them out too. I was talking, I've said this before, but I was talking to a guy from up north that uh, worked for a union printing shop, and he was down here talking one day, and uh, he was talking about he has to work next to people that are blooming idiots. He said that uh, there's no way that those people would be there if they weren't a union employee, that uh, they can't function, and there's nothing they can do about it. He said there's nothing they can do about it. So I'd say that's part of the problem, too. Well, let me, let me say one thing, though. You were talking about the oil. This, this attack in Algeria that happened a couple of weeks ago ought to be really, really frightening to people because the, the al-Qaeda people have figured out how much damage it would do to our entire country if they could disrupt the oil supply. And so what did they do? They attacked one of our uh, oil processing plants. If that becomes a strategy across the world, they could bring us to our knees pretty quickly. There, 
There's a lot of ways that terrorism can bring us to our knees pretty quickly. Well, the problem there, for example, just this week, you have 146 House members in a bipartisan letter have requested approval of the Keystone Pipeline. Yeah, That's something the president could do that, while it's not a long-term fix, it's not natural gas, it's not solar, it's not wind, but right now, this is what our economy runs on is oil. And he has now been requested bipartisan, and a matter of fact, a majority of the Senate in bipartisan faction has said if they, he, they will approve it, the Senate will approve it. But the White House is still dragging its feet and saying they need to study it more. Every study has come back and said this thing would be safe. Governor Hickenlooper, I believe in Colorado, has now approved the revised uh, pathway for it. But the White House is still dragging their feet on this. And what John just mentioned. Though, why why and, would they drag their feet, frankly? Well, you know, tell John, me, tell me John, what the John skipped over the, the last part of it there. Okay. He talked about revised pathway. That was the big objection to the Keystone Pipeline initially anyway. It was the route that it was taken took it across some very environmentally sensitive areas of the country. <laughs> There's always going to be environmental sensitive areas of the country. And when so, you're dealing so, with these so left-wing why, liberals, and so, Franklin, so why you'll never that find that As long well, as he's going to study no, that ask, environmentally, he'll never let it do pass. Do you really believe that we shouldn't ever consider that in these projects? It's been over two and a half years, Franklin. The Nebraska Governor Dave Hindman recently approved a revised route the for the pipeline. For the well, because there's 12 different states involved. It's okay. not one state. All right. Why don't we just say it? Not all the states agreed, by the well, way. Well, let me ask you a question, Franklin. The 87% uh, of the residents of Alaska agreed on drilling for oil in, in Alaska, and the president won't do that. Yet, and that's only we the do state drill of Alaska. For oil in Alaska they, John. they all approved for an, an expansion of the Anwar drilling. And they approved a pipeline, none of which he will do. Mm -hmm. The Obama administration now says that they were still reviewing the project and they didn't want to get ahead of that process on the pipeline. It's been almost three years now. The new route that you're talking about has just been arrived at in the last several months, John. Well, the governor the says approve it. Of Nebraska said we're okay with it. Let's go. Well, hey. by all means, the governor of Nebraska should make all of our decisions for us. Well, when he said he wanted to delay it, you were when he said he wanted to delay it. He's looking Franklin, out for me. When he said he wanted to delay it, you said yes, we should delay it because the governor wants it delayed. Well, now the governor's saying I'm okay with it. Let's move. No, what I said was that there is nothing wrong with us looking into the environmental implications. How long, of Franklin? These projects. Two more years, five more Do years, we ten more years. One. Well, guess what? Canada's building the pipeline over to the coast and selling the oil to China. So when you they're when going to sell the oil to China no, anyway. They no, they weren't. They no, were wait, trying no. to sell it to us. Wait, this is one. Now this is ridiculous. First of all, you can't make this stuff up. This stuff was all supposed to go down to the Gulf Coast refineries where it's getting shipped out. This is not. This is oil going on to the international market. Being processed by do. American citizens it, who need well, jobs. That's a, well, that's a separate question, John, from getting the oh, oil. Oh, I'm sorry. I did, is that above the president's pay grade? No, it's not, John. But you can't switch horses in midstream. I'm not switching horses. I'm saying yes, do the are. pipeline. It helps on all kinds of levels. It didn't have anything to do with our energy independence, though. Hey, Bird Dog, we weren't going to talk about Obama or any of that this morning. This, uh, But somehow we cannot get around it. So, uh, anyway... Uh, we can talk about this until we're blue in the face, but, uh, you know. Uh, by the way, I also predicted about about six, eight months ago that the Keystone Pipeline will get approved and will be built. We'll see. Uh, well, it could have been built years ago, and people could have had jobs for years at this point. Let's talk about the Boy Scouts right now, John. I know you're an uh, uh, Eagle Scout, and, uh, you know, it's uh, – pretty disappointing when you sit there and see the boy scouts uh, may in a ban on their gay youth leaders i mean how in the world are they going to handle that well the the liberal left in america and and especially the gay and lesbian movement are basically bullies and what you have here is you have a successful if they do it you have a successful bullying uh, effort and we're going to reward the bullies I don't see how it can possibly work. But well, there's multiple problems. Franklin can probably address one of my concerns is about legalities. What the boys? I actually find what the Boy Scout, if they do this, it's somewhat cowardly as well, the way they're doing it. Because what they're doing is they're pushing off all of the legal problems onto the sponsoring uh, venues, whether it's a church or a civic group that sponsors. They're saying, well, we're not going to say. You can say. Well, what that means if, is if yeah. they decide not to, instead of suing the Boy Scouts, someone 
someone will sue that little local They're going to sue Broad Street Methodist Church for sponsoring a Boy Scout unit. Right. Over 70% of the sponsoring uh, entities are churches. Right. Uh, that's not good. Uh, I saw where UPS was one of the sponsors that pulled out. Who else was it pulled out? Uh, There's been several. There's some big personal donors that have threatened it. I think uh, UPS was one of the big ones. There was one of the other big companies that said they were withholding any uh, donations to the Boy Scouts. Here's my problem with the whole thing. Um, The Boy Scouts is a private organization, and as a private organization, they should have the right to do whatever they want to do. My problem with this is, no one told the gay and lesbian movement that they couldn't form their own scouting program. Right. No one tells them they can't form their own church. Why is it so important for them to force someone else to accept their values? I don't know. It's amazing to me. And, and from that standpoint, and, and maybe Franklin can explain this to me, does a boy who's a straight boy have a right to not sleep in a tent where he's concerned that another boy might be looking at him in a sexual manner Mm -hmm. does he have that right does a little boy have the right to get in the the girl scouts well that's the question if you're saying that because the the tents for example you assign those tents randomly you say joe you and fred are going to tent together sam you and uh uh, Mm -hmm. joey are going to tent together yeah well if you're going to say that, that a boy can't say, look, I really don't want to undress and be in a, a close proximity tent with someone who's looking at me in a sexual manner, then how can you say boys and girls should be separate? Why, sh- why don't we just merge the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts together and just throw them all out there? What's the answers, Franklin? Well, it's the same argument that was made, uh, that's been made about gays in the military. Uh, that hasn't proved to be... Well, now we're talking about little children. No, no, no. What we're talking about is... And adult gays. We're talking about... Mixing them. Well, first of all, uh, being gay doesn't mean you're a pedophile, and that seems to be the underlying No, it doesn't. Franklin, the point here is the logic should follow. If the Girl Scouts don't allow male... Uh, leaders to take little girls on overnight events, what, what is the logical disconnect that says a gay adult should be allowed to take young boys on an overnight event? Well, because there's no connection between being gay and being a threat to children. I, 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 all right, I'm going to give you that. But then my point here on a logical basis is, then why should a male leader not be allowed to take little girls on an overnight event? I mean, if you're going to people wouldn't care about that. Well, then let's push that. Why in the gay gay lobby pushing that? Let's just take all of these boundaries down. Well, it's it's not that different, John. I mean, most Cub Scout organizations have female leaders. They also have they they have the whole family there, and they go to camping as a family. They don't go separate. The Boy Scouts is when that boy takes a step as more of an independent entity. I'm not questioning that. I'm just saying I don't understand. We don't have any problem with females supervising young boys in the Cub Scouts. Well, the Girl Scouts What's the difference? do. Franklin, does a boy who's a straight boy, it, let, let's say he comes to your law office and he says, they're forcing me to tent with a gay boy and I feel uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable. Do you defend that boy and say they sh- don't have the right to force him to sleep in that situation? I would suspect that common sense would prevail and People would go, okay, let's put you in a different tent. Not everybody's going to have that concern. Well, but Franklin, the problem is as an organization, as soon as they do that, the the gay scout is then going to turn around and say, I'm being discriminated against because of my sexuality. I'm going to sue you. Well, I don't know that that is discrimination, John. First of all, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll wait for that lawsuit because I'm sure it's coming, and we'll the, see if you, you know, hold the, that the, same the, position. The thrust I'm going to tell you, you know, you you talking about pedophiles. I think that this is going to attract pedophiles. I really do think this, Franklin. I think that you've got you've got some sick sick people that are going to come but, in and get involved with this. Pedophile now. doesn't mean gay. Yeah. Well, but here's the problem. Franklin. I'm talking about sick, well, sexually wait, wait minute, sick. Wait a, minute, wait a minute. Why wouldn't why wouldn't being a, a Boy Scout leader already be attracting pedophiles. It then. does. But you're removing... I mean, there's no difference in that. It does, Franklin. But here's the problem. Does anybody want to discuss the fact that every child that was molested in the Boy Scouts was molested by a, another man? So it's a... I, you know, you all don't want to say that's a homosexual act, but a lot of us out in the real world have a problem seeing how it's not a homosexual act. 
There are no girls in the Boy Scouts. So any any molestation that happens is a man molesting another boy. Right. Well, I suppose there some, the I wasn't suppose, there some court battles just settled over some of this stuff not long ago. I, I, don't the Boy those, I don't know that those there's cases been, have ever they've, they've, the they've for, Yeah, here recently they forced the Boy Scouts to release all of their files. And they have oh, yeah. kept extensive files over the years. And like any organization, I don't know that I agree with everything they did. I'm a pretty law and order person, and I'd, I'd prosecute people the up question, one side and down the much other. Like, much like the issue that rose with the Catholic Church, there was a question about them not disclosing information that they about things that had happened uh, and so that was, John would probably know more about it than I would because he's been involved in scouting. You know, the problem is with any of these, any organization, and especially with the media culture that we have now, you have 24-7 news coverage. You've, act, you've got to try to protect your, your image as well. And so you look at something that happened 20 or 25 years ago and you go, you know what, we royally screwed up. And the board may have fixed that decades ago, but you still don't necessarily want it plastered on the news 24 seven because people don't really care whether it happened last yeah. year or 20 years ago. So they've kept some of their files. And they also had a legitimate concern that Franklin might, might understand as well that look some of these people were just accused it's not right to slander someone when there's no proof and there's no way to go back and prove it so they kept some of their files secret a lot of the organizations pushed them hard took them to court they've released their files much like the catholic church files and there's been some criticism that you covered this up there was also a lot of, of trouble with the Boy Scouts were a private organization. They weren't hugely funded. You know, they were probably funded better than a lot. But the point is they weren't some government entity. So a lot of times a predator could get in trouble in Wisconsin in the Boy Scouts. He could move to Georgia. And two or three years later, he might apply to be a leader in Georgia. And there wasn't a huge clearinghouse nationally to know that he had been in trouble uh, somewhere else. So some of that happened. And they're being blamed for that. All right. Let's take a break. We'll come back in a few minutes and open up the phone lines. You are listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Check into, check into cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the max. Short on cash? Check into cash gives you more money for your title and the lowest title loan rate anywhere. If you already have a title loan, ask Check into Cash about paying it off. Check into cash loans you the most for your title. Get the lowest rate on a title loan and the most money only at Check into Cash. Check into Check into Cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the max. Oh, yeah. Check into Cash is your money machine. Get on up and get down. Bring proof of lower rate on similar title loan restrictions apply. Visit checkintocash.com for the store nearest you. Train endurance engineers spend their lives pushing our heating and cooling units to the brink. But they're like anyone else. They go to sporting events. Big Daddy just pulverizing fancy boy. They go on vacations. Salt water! Take a little hot! And they go to work, putting train units through every test imaginable. Water cannon ready, sir. Any words for Big Daddy? It might... Sting. They're the reason a train is so reliable. A little. But where did they come up with the ideas? This is the perfect time to get your heating equipment serviced. Maximum capacity and efficiency can be maintained if your system is in good operating order. Call Mechanical Systems today to get $20 off of your heating equipment inspection and service. We also design and sell new high efficiency systems and change outs are our specialty. Mechanical Systems has been providing high quality service and installations for over 30 years. 336-5739. That same number is good for 24-7 emergency repairs. That's 423-336-5739. It's hard. Hard to stop a train. Really hard. The Bald Headed Bistro has a brand new menu offering more value for your dollar. The Bald Headed Bistro, Western Fine Dining in the heart of the South. The best bar and happy hour in town. 
The Bald Headed Bistro in the Village Green, Cleveland. Are you looking for the best beer and cigarette prices in Bradley County? Well, look no further than Tom.